Welcome to the Godzilla Vlogs, a podcast for everything and anything Godzilla. Here is your host, Adam Noyes. Hello, everybody. I'm honestly still kind of getting used to this new layout, uh, you know, kind of going back to it when, when I used to sit in front of the camera nonstop. Hopefully this is a little more entertaining than that, but I wanted to go a little less formal uh, with this new layout. And today I'm going to be talking about someone that I've wanted to talk about for quite a while. I just haven't had the balls to do. Uh, and that's Tomiyuki Tanaka. I've been wanting to talk about Tomiyuki Tanaka for a while. And particularly, in this podcast, I'm kind of focusing on the later years of this man's quite prolific career. Uh, and and that being said, uh, there, there's going to be a lot of history in this. And, and a lot of this has been me doing a buttload of research. I went down the rabbit hole in, in terms of Tomiyuki Tanaka, looking into a lot of interviews with this guy uh, and with people who have worked around him. Right from the get-go, I, I would argue that Tomiyuki Tanaka is the most prolific and probably best-known producer to come from Japan. I mean... I mean, not only did he create and produce every Toho science fiction flick, you know, including the original Godzilla, but he also produced several of Akira Kurosawa's films and a lot of other big-budget Japanese films as well. And recently, I've, I've kind of grown an obsession with learning about this man and how he made films. It's clear that Tanaka loved movies. He just adored them. He loved making movies. I've read several interviews, including the main one I used as a source here in this podcast, clearly demonstrating that Tanaka's tenacity on the production of any film he had his hands on was was rather great, more than a lot of other producers. Especially in the 60s, Tanaka was extremely hands-on, often contributing greatly to the stories he wanted to tell. Uh, on movies like Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, even The Mysterians, those are some of his earlier movies, Tanaka was known for getting an idea for something he saw and, or, or read, and then hiring a professional writer, often a book author, to pen out an original draft or just a detailed outline. Uh, he even did this with Mothra. He'd then refine it before giving the story to screenwriters and so on and so forth. That's usually what he did, especially early on. And I've got loads of pictures of this man on set. Hopefully you'll be seeing some of those in the, in the slideshow. There's even stories of him actually tinkering with shots and set pieces. So he was very hands-on, for good and for bad. Someone like Ishiro Honda or even Kazuki Omori didn't really mind this kind of hands-on approach. In fact, I'd argue they welcomed it, especially in pre-production. But someone like me, you know, I'd find that kind of producer to be kind of annoying. Like, he's doing my job, and I don't really really like that, but that's just me. And that's sort of similar to how probably a director like Taki Okawara wouldn't have liked working with him that much either. I mean, Okawara was famous for disliking Goichi Kawakita's effects, and that those two never really got along. They butt heads constantly. I've done an entire podcast on that, so if you want to listen to that, go ahead and check that out as well. The show just how much influence Tanaka had in the golden age of Japanese cinema. It was actually Tanaka who birthed Mothra. And there's a key reason why I bring that up. Mothra is what led to King Kong vs. Godzilla, which was the most successful Godzilla movie ever until recently, uh, which led to Mothra vs. Godzilla, which then commu uh, accumulated into Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster. And thus a pattern was born to make Godzilla more and more childish or to appeal to a younger and younger audience. It was Tomi Tanaka that really spearheaded that mentality. Of course, this was business. That mentality was truly stemmed from business. That's where the money was, both domestic and overseas. It was the younger people, teens and children, especially children, as it got into even the 70s, that were watching these movies. And it also didn't help that Eiji Tsuburaya was also looking to push Godzilla into a more campy light with decisions like Godzilla's Dance and Invasion of Astro Monster. But to Tanaka's credit, he wasn't just pushing kaiju movies to become more and more campy. He wasn't just doing that. 
This is why in the mid-60s we'd actually see two teams emerge from Toho. You'd have Group A, which was usually Ishiro Honda, Eiji Tsuburaya, Takashi Kimura, and Akira Fukube, and they'd be working on the more expensive or often more serious giant monster sci-fi flicks. And the two that come to mind where they sort of did this dual partnership was War of the Gargantuas and Frankenstein Conquers the World. Those were more of the A pictures of the kaiju genre. And then there was a brand new Group B, and Group B was helmed by Jun Fukuda, Salamasa Arikawa, Masaru Sato, Shinichi Sekizawa, and they're off making the cheaper Godzilla movies. And the two that come to mind are Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster and Son of Godzilla, which were made for peanuts compared to all of the other Godzilla movies in the 60s and before. And these were campier, and I would argue less sophisticated movies, but that's not saying they aren't fun and they aren't good movies. They, they still are, are great. I'll also give Tanaka a lot of credit as well, because he he did admit that moving Godzilla towards children was the biggest mistake of his career, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Tanaka would often be juggling three, four, or even five movies a year, and having two will often be sci-fi related with multiple crews and directors. So this guy had to be organized, had to be controlled, had to just love his job, or this would have just all come crumbling apart quickly. And to say that Tanaka, though not technically the head of the film department at Toho yet, was basically the big producer there. And that's almost an understatement. And also to say he was the most successful is also kind of understated, because his Kurosawa flicks were not making money overseas, despite what people would say. They were not. It was his drive-in sci-fi films, or the movies that were being played on TV. Those were the films people were seeing. And those were spearheaded by Tanaka. So, I'd say it was safe to bet that Tanaka had his own little empire. David Callant would refer to this period of time as a factory. He called Toho a factory, pumping out Kurosawa outhouse, outhouse flicks, these more pop culture oriented kaiju and tokusatsu flicks left and right. I mean, look at 1964, the high point of this area. Tanaka produced three kaiju movies. Three. Mothra vs. Godzilla, Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster, and Dogura the Space Monster. And these movies shared the same writers, many of the same actors, the same director, same special effects director, same composer. Yeah, i say Khaled's assessment was correct. And a lot of that was because Tomoyuki Tanaka's absolute tenacity at making movies. Now this podcast is supposed to be focused on his later years, right? I promise that. Uh, and I promise that it is, but... Uh, I really wanted to paint a small picture of who Tanaka was and just what kind of influence this man had on the movies he made. To understand what happened to him, it's important to know how he got there. So, moving on, let's chat about the 1970s, because this is when Tanaka's little empire really began to fall apart. But a lot of what happened in the 1970s was stemmed because people were not going to movie theaters and they were just simply staying home to watch TV. And because of that, movies became harder and harder and harder to make. I mean, Toho would go from being a major conglomerate into a, a segregated company. And I'm not quite sure if that's really the right word, but it, it, with teams. And, and for example, they, they made... Um, Toho Eizo. Toho Eizo just made the special effects movies. And then a lot of what Toho was actually making they weren't actually making. They're being produced by other companies and then just distributed by Toho. Meaning that they have to share the wealth a little bit with not only that production company, but themselves and the other staffs. So Tanaka had a hard time adapting to this reality. And I truly think he looked at TV as an enemy, not a friend. Which sort of echoes the sentiments felt in 1950s America when Hollywood fought the television stations. To say Tanaka was having a tough time keeping himself and... I would even argo Toho afloat. Tanaka's stress level went through the roof. And here's where I'm not sure what happened. Because according to Fumio Tanaka, no relations, uh, on, on the Space Amoeba audio commentary, which, which I highly recommend, by the way, Tanaka suffered a major mental breakdown. Others say he had a heart attack. Some say he had a stroke. Some people say he was just tired. Either way, 
Tanaka was in the hospital for a period of time. And this period of time is a, a key element because it's exactly where Toho broke apart. Because Fumio Tanaka, who took over the production of Space Amoeba um, from Tobinuki Tanaka, refused to put a dedication to Eiji Tsuburaya, who had his own empire. Uh, his own empire in his own right. At the beginning of the film, Toho's first choice of replacement, Sadamasa Arikawa, he quit in disgust. Fumio uh, Tanaka has tried to defend himself many times on this decision that he made. I do not think he he even realized the amount of backlash he got just from not putting that little dedication at the beginning of the film. But he stated it was because nobody at Toho who was working on that particular film really cared, and that's a bunch of hogwash. But not only did Sanamasa Arikawa quit, but it was like a domino effect, because then followed over half the Toho special effects staff who would go on to be freelancers uh, and work abroad. And so did Ishiro Honda. Some would say, like Fumio Tanaka, that Tomiyuki Tanaka returned too soon. But how couldn't he? I mean, he just lost th his biggest moneymakers because of that one decision. Now, I'm sure that wasn't the only reason why that happened. But that's the biggest reason I've heard stated by many of the people within the special effects crew. And all of this kind of exploded. Um during the making of Godzilla vs. Hedora, Tomoyuki Tanaka was so horrified by what he was watching, he essentially destroyed, and I mean destroyed, crushed it with the biggest boulder he could find, Yoshi Mitsubana's entire career. You've ruined Godzilla, he said. Meanwhile, I'd like to point out that these decisions were made from a hospital bed, the decision made while no doubt he was medicated up, and while it was Tanaka himself calling for the budgets on Godzilla vs. Hedorah to be slashed time and time and time again, and the time to make the movie to be slashed time and time and time again. So it was sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that Yoshimitsu Bana was kind of handed a bag of shit and had to try to somehow crawl his way out of it. I mean, he wrote a few things after that, but his career was destroyed. So this was certainly the lowest point for Tanaka's empire so far, going from a roaring enterprise to something limping along and barely staying alive. And it all ends with Jun Fukuda's rather terrible film War in Space in 1977, which that officially brought an end to Toho's classic era of science fiction movies. Everything after that, despite the official era not starting until 1989, would be referred to as Heisei era films. So Tanaka would go from producing two to four films a year in this period down to doing none for several years. And he produced a couple of disaster movies for Shuchiku, too, leaving Toho behind often. I mean, Tanaka did this frequently. Tanaka did this for Toshiro Mufune's production company. He worked with Toshiro Mufune, Mufi, Mufune Productions frequently. But he always made sure that the movies were at least distributed by Toho. Then he found a small revival in 1984 because he wanted to reinvent Godzilla and bring him back to his roots. And he did just that, producing the lavishly expensive Return of Godzilla, which was also Teriyushi Nakano's swan song. But let's look at how old Tanaka is now, how old he was in 1984. He's a 74-year-old man making a gargantuanly expensive movie, and this age will come back to bite him along with his health problems stemming back for what occurred in the 1970s. All that sort of comes back to bite him in the ass. Now, Godzilla 84 was a has a ridiculous amount of production problems right from the get-go, and a tons of reshoots and budget overruns, but the movie proves to be a pretty big success. But Kazuki Omori implied in, a, in an interview with that Tanaka was not pleased with how the movie turned out. Which is partially why it took until 1989 for another Godzilla movie to be made. And it's also one reason why we why Tanaka would choose Kazuki Omori to essentially head another reboot Godzilla movie. Uh, because, let's face it, despite Biolante being a sequel to 84, it is basically a brand new revamp. Not just in terms of the time set between the two films, but also just in terms of tone and structure. Uh, com almost completely different. Now, another reason was Tanaka was pouring a lot of time and energy into a revamp of Mothra, only to ditch this idea 
in favor of Godzilla for more marketing value. Tomiyuki Tanaka began banking on the idea of getting Godzilla to play overseas again. Now remember that by the late 1960s and the 1970s, drive-in theaters were declining in viewership and being replaced with home TVs. So even the foreign market that Toho needed more and more and more to cover their production costs were going away. So add that to your money problems. And, and Tanaka wanted to take Godzilla in a brand new direction. And Amori and Tanaka managed to actually get along quite well, uh, especially during the making of Biolanti. So much so that Tanaka would go on to say no one but Kazuki Omori could have made these movies. Is that Omori wanted to bring Ifukube on to do the score for Biolanti. Now, according to Omori, Tanaka never liked Ifukube's music. And that was because if, uh, Ifukube often brought Japanese motifs and instruments into his scores. It sounded Japanese. Which is not what Tanaka wanted for this revamped Godzilla series. Now, I don't know if he actually felt that way about Ifukube throughout his entire career. We know that is certainly how he felt about bringing Ifukube back for the Heisei era of Godzilla films. And this is also why uh, Koichi Sugiyama was brought on. Uh, because Tanaka wanted music that sounded like John Williams, quote, to sound like John Williams. And to him, Sugiyama did just that. Ifukube was Ifukube. No matter what I listen to, if, if, if I listen to a score, have no idea who it's from, I can instantly recognize it's Ifukube. Amori, too, would go on to say that Sugiyama would have been his choice to replace Ifukube if Ifukube continued to decline making Godzilla scores. And of course, we know that Ifukube would come back in 91 to score Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Something else Tanaka wanted was a monster that could transform. Perhaps another carryover from Tanaka's failed Mothra reboot. Look at what's going on here. Tanaka seemed to be coming back, and with a bang. Because throughout the making of Biolanti, everyone involved with the production knew that they were making a good movie. And when Tanaka sat down to watch the film in its completion, he called it the greatest Godzilla movie ever. And that sentiment was later reassured when Japan themselves voted, voted Godzilla vs. Biolanti the greatest Godzilla movie of all time, even beating the original. But Biolanti did not do well at the box office, let alone get a chance to be released theatrically overseas like Tanaka hoped. This time period, just after the release of Biolanti, we see a new character enter the playing field, and that is Shogo Tomiyama. It's hard to prove, but we know that Tanaka wanted to push Godzilla into a more worldly direction. He wanted to reach a much broader audience. But the lack of success from Biolanti was kind of the final nail in the coffin for him. Look at who is now working on these movies. New composers, new directors, new special effects director, new writers. The only carryover from the golden age of Godzilla was Tomiyuki Tanaka himself. Now, according to Kazuki Omori, Tanaka wanted to push Godzilla into a more fantasy realm, saying Godzilla is in a fantasy world. He wanted to make Godzilla more like aliens. This was during the development of Biolanti. Kazuki Omaro went on to say, To be honest, I was not interested in Godzilla vs. Biolanti. I was more interested in Godzilla vs. the Japanese Self-Defense Force. This mentality would ultimately split their partnership. It all came to a head during the production of Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Toho and Shogo Tomoyama wanted to make one more Godzilla movie, bringing back classic Godzilla monsters for him to fight. And immediately... King Ghidorah came to mind. Now, of course, I'm skipping over a lot of details here, I know. I know about King Kong and all that stuff. But it was the ultimate decision to use King Ghidorah that led to Tanaka being, well, essentially promoted so much that he had no power on production anymore. Tanaka wanted King Ghidorah to be a space monster, to keep that origin the same, like he always was. But Omori flat out refused. Omori said, and I'm quoting here, I'm not making a silly space monster movie. And Omori won out. For the first time, Tanaka was overruled. By who? It's not really known. But my guess is Shogo Tomiyama, Kazuki Omori, and a few others going to the brass at Toho that ultimately caused them to overrule Tanaka. Because not long after this, 
we see Tanaka getting his big time promotions. What happens to Tanaka is essentially what happened to Gene Roddenberry during the original movies. He got promoted so much that he had no say in the actual production of the movies themselves. I mean, what was Toho going to do? Are they going to fire Tanaka? That wasn't going to happen. I, I mean, this is the man who created Godzilla. Literally created Godzilla. This is one of the last major tycoons of Japanese cinema alive. Firing him would be a disaster. So you do the next best thing. You sun And suddenly almost every decision made by Tanaka was blatantly ignored. And King Ghidorah marks the first time Shogo Tomoyama actually ran the show, and he would do so for the remainder of Godzilla's mainstay in cinema until 2004. Tomoyama chose Takio Okawara to place Omori when Omori wasn't to his liking. Tomoyama was the man who chose to revamp old, known Godzilla kaijus instead of making new ones, at least up until Space Godzilla. And Tanaka basically remained a producer in name only from this time forward. And it's unknown how... Tanaka felt about this. I doubt he liked it, knowing the kind of man that he was in his prime. Well, with all that said, it's hard to ignore his age, too. I mean, uh, he would have been in his 80s by the time the Heisei series was in full swing. Could he have handled Godzilla anymore? Because in truth, a movie made on such a tight budget or such a tight deadline, they need to have a good producer at the helm, or else you get something crazy like Evans Gate or Cleopatra, where the producers did absolutely nothing, and look what happened to those films. A film run amok, basically. Sure, I won't lie. Knowing what I do now about Tanaka, and what he wanted, and what direction he wanted to bring the Heisei Godzilla movies in, has me wondering what kind of direction these movies would have taken if he had actually gotten his way. Would it have been more in line with the fantasy world, like in 60s Godzilla? Would it have been darker? Would it have been stories... Would the stories have remained more complex, like in Biolante? There's a lot of conflic uh, conflicting info on this, because while well, Tomi Kitanaka is dead, and uh, Omori said people thought Biolante failed because its story was too complex, and Tanaka wanted it dumbed down. Others say that Tanaka wanted to double down on his complex plots, but was overruled by Shogo Tomoyama and others. I don't know what happened. But there is no doubt in my mind, that Tomi Tanaka's empire ended with Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Sure, he has... He was always listed as producer, but he really wasn't. Some would say that Godzilla himself is Tanaka's empire, but I'd argue that Tanaka's hand on devotion to his work marked the end of his reign of power. Really, anywhere. He was overruled, too old, too weak and maybe even too old school for the new direction Godzilla was clearly heading in. And maybe it was for the best, maybe not. I don't know. What do you think? Something I do want to know is how the man truly felt about all this. A giant, now reduced to a figurehead or a warm body for an empty office. Kind of a sad story or conclusion to such a gargantuan titan of cinema... But I also want to remind you that this man's legacy is easily, easily able to stand up to those of Ishiro Honda, Akira Fukube, and Eiji Tsuburaya. In fact, I would say it surpassed those. We do need to remember him. He does need to have more, more light shined on to him. Uh, Tomi Tanaka and Shinichi Sekizawa, particularly, are the two people that are in this this area that I think need more, more of a spotlight on him. Anyways. Thank you all for, for listening. What do you think about Tomi Tanaka? What do you think of him as, as a producer and everything like that? Uh, go on Facebook, like any Productions for all up-to-date information of what we're doing. And in the end, this is Adam Noyce of AN Productions saying sayonara. Sayonara.